to tell the story of why wood sounds, uh, I think it would be really, it'll be more effective if I talk to you about what I've experienced at festivals as people have interacted with the flutes. And so I'll bring back some different examples uh, throughout this video uh, that illustrate different points from customer interactions that I've had. For example, one of the things that happens when people come into uh, the Wood Sounds booth at a show, the first thing that I hear, someone will say something like, oh my gosh, that these flutes are so beautiful. Oh, and they'll just go on and on about the beauty of the instruments. And, and then they pick it up and they play it. Oh, wow. The flute plays so easy, it plays itself. The sound is incredible. So I hear these things very regularly. Um, the flute plays so easy, it plays itself. When I was talking about why wood sounds, my wife said, honey, you don't have the comment that people make most often uh, in this why wood sounds thing at all. And I was like, what are you talking about? What do people say when they come in the booth? Well, they say how beautiful the flutes are. Yeah, and then? Well, they say, well, flute's so easy, it plays itself. And she says, yeah, yeah, that's like it. You gotta put that in there. And so I guess she's right. That probably is the, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, is so uh, prevalent in, in what we hear from our clients. So there's, there's really three things that come together to create that experience for people. That, oh gosh, the flute plays so easy, it plays itself. Um, and these things, three things are the voicing of the flute, how the flute is tuned, and what kind of volume dynamics the flute has. When those three things come together uh, in, in a really great way, you have a synergistic um, magic that happens and an instrument feels like it just comes alive in your hands. And it is really wonderful to experience. I still have that experience when I pick up flutes. Uh, some flutes more than the other for me because I play lots of our flutes. But uh, I'll pick up a flute sometimes and I just like, I can't stop playing it because it just is so easy and fun to play. So the first thing is, is the voice of the flute. How does the flute sound? Hi, can you talk to us a little bit about um, what we're aiming for with the voicing of our flutes and, and things? So one of the things uh, I love about the Wood Sounds flutes is, is the, the voice. You know, we get a rich, beautiful, full, woody sound of, um, of the flute. Um, and all of that comes down to the voicing of the flute itself. You know, I don't know exactly when it was when you started, when we started naming, you know, all of the... Yeah, 2009. Yeah, so we started to identify, you know, and quantify, you know, everything in the voice, voicing area we could properly identify you know, all the angles and, and changes that needed to be made. And so when we're communicating, we can make changes or we can use the proper terminology to, to make the flute sound um, the best it can. For example, we could say, oh, the mu needs um, some work, and I know exactly what you mean, or you know exactly what I mean if I say you know, the alpha or the yeah, or something like that. One of the names we have. Or, or lambda's too thick. Exactly, and yeah. I know exactly what you mean, and I know exactly what it is that I need to do. Mm -hmm. And that is just awesome. I love that. It really made an enormous change um, in the quality of our flutes, naming these surfaces. So within the voice box area, and what we're talking about in the voice box is uh, the embouchure hole, which is the hole that creates a sound. Some people call it a TSH. Uh, true sound hole. I, I don't personally care for that term uh, as there already is a term for the embouchure hole uh, in, the, in the flute world. Uh, then you got this ramp, you got the exit hole from the slow air chamber, you've got this flat surface out here. All of this area is what I call the voice box of the flute. And, uh, and within the voice box of the flute there's over 15 surfaces and angles that are critical to the sound of the instrument and that we, we sand, manipulate, uh, file, uh, in some way or another, we're, we're actively engaged in working on those surfaces, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, when I first hired Ty, I, uh, he, he came over um, 
and I asked him to bring a piece of his uh, uh, silver work that he had been working on. The, uh, and so he brought this ring over and I took the ring and looked it all over and then I turned it upside down and I looked at where it was soldered. The band was soldered to the, the bezel, is it? Yeah. A bezel. So it was a cabochon, piece of turquoise cabochon, is that right? Yeah. Uh, in the bezel and then, then it had a band attached to the bezel and uh, you know, so you could wear it. I looked at it and I'm like, I can't see. Like there's no little meniscus of, of solder that has, you know, in between the, the band and, and the bezel. I, it was just, the band went in and then the bezel started. What the crap, how did he do that? It was amazing. And at that point I said, so uh, how did you attach this tie? Well, I soldered it. I don't see any solder tie. Well, I used little files to, to get that really flat and square and precise. And I was like, I'm hiring. And that was it. I mean, from then on, I was talking to him about, you know, well, I got to know him a little bit better. And then I talked to him about the things that I, I like in, in what we do and what we're striving to accomplish here at Woodsides. That same precision transfers exactly perfectly into the voicing of the flutes because little teeny changes can make an enormous change. Yeah. yeah, you mentioned mu, and that's a that's a surface that isn't actually in the um, directly in the wind path of the flute, and yet if there's anything in there that is not smooth and and right, the flute sounds dirty. Um, it can have have turbulence and and different things, and I. It was so surprising to me when I discovered that it completely shocked and surprised me that it would make that much difference. But anyways, so so the voicing is critical. Having a, you know being able to have that big, beautiful, rich, fat sound that that we all love from the native flute is um, yeah, I love it. You know when you play a flute and you just completely get lost in the sound. Woo, baby, that's it. So let's talk about volume dynamics. Volume dynamics is how loud and soft can you play the flute. Built within the physics of the instrument, this is right down to how it works, there is this dichotomy, these, these op opposing ideas. On the fundamental note, when you have all the holes closed, it's easy as a flute maker to make a flute that plays the fundamental note soft. It's hard to make a flute that plays a fundamental note loud. Conversely, on the octave note, which is a third finger down and everything else open, it's easy to make a flute that plays the octave note loud, but it's hard to make one that plays the octave note soft. So you have this natural opposition within the flute that goes right down to the physics of how the, the instrument is, is uh, functions and, and it causes people to want to play the flute from soft to loud. So as you go up the flute, you play louder and louder. On our flutes, that is not the case. We, uh, we tune our flutes to a constant breath pressure across the instrument. And Ty will talk more about that specifically here in just a minute. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate this to you, this volume dynamics. The, uh, and the way I'm gonna do this, and this is a really great exercise to, to do when you're uh, introducing yourself to a new flute. So to do this exercise, I'm gonna cover all of the holes. We're gonna play the fundamental note, and I'm gonna come in with a very, very small breath. And then I'm gonna increase that breath until the flute overblows, and then I'll bring the pressure back down. And I'm gonna do this all in one breath in nice, smooth transitions. What this is going to allow me to do is my body, you know, my mind isn't going to know, but my body is going to know uh, the pressures that I can play the flute at by doing this. So I'll cover them up and... I'll do it again. There's a, this flute will warble if I position the totem just right. And uh, you pull it back just a, a fraction and it gets to a, an even smoother transition. I 
I'm just gonna have to show you this warble because it's fun. I know some people love warbles, but so I pushed the totem forward a little bit. Isn't that fun? So what's happening when it warbles is it's jumping between the octaves and it's jumping back and forth. So I pull that back just a smidge. And I get a smooth transition. So now we'll go up to the octave note. This is a third finger covered, everything else open. I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna start very, very soft. I'm gonna start so soft, I'm gonna be into the edge notes. Edge notes is a beautiful thing to play with. We'll talk about that in another video. So we'll start here and you're gonna hear these squeaky sort of sounds when I first start playing. And then the sound is gonna change. It's gonna go into some sound saturation. And that's, that's where our real note is that we're looking for. The, uh, the edge notes can be a lot of fun in, in decorating your music with bird chirps and animal calls and things like that. Um, but to get the actual note, it takes just a teeny little bit more pressure. And these pressures are extremely light. So I'll increase the breath pressure from, from that small pressure. And as I do, you'll hear the sound saturation get thicker and thicker and fuller and fuller and really rich. And, and then I'll continue to increase that pressure and you'll begin to hear the flute go into uh, turbulent flow. It's not fully turbulent flow, but it's starting to transition from laminar flow to turbulent. And then that will cause what you'll hear is, is, um, is uh, air, uh, it, it can be, you could call it air sort of sound, entrained air, um, breathiness, although there's so much sound, it's hard to call it breathy. So well, I'll give you an example. Edge notes. I did that one with not very full press, so let me try again. And at that really high pressure, do you hear how the sound starts getting diffuse again? And we lose some of the sound saturation. Really what's happening is that flow is getting turbulent and we're not getting consistent, um, consistent fluctuations in our, our splitting edge. This volume dynamics is, is super important for a couple of reasons. One is it makes it so that a new player can pick up the flute and whatever breath pressure they apply to it, it sounds good. Whether they're blowing soft, and that's like nothing, hardly any air at all. And, or they're playing loud. and it sounds good. Hard breath, soft breath, flute sounds good. So a new player, they sound magnificent when they pick up the instrument. Um, these are the things that obviously create that feeling of, wow, the flute plays itself. The, uh, the other thing that's really, really important about the volume dynamics is the ability to emote with the flute, to create content in your music that causes a, an emotional reaction within your audience in a positive way. So one of the songs, I, I feel Amazing Grace is a really good song for me to play because it's easy to, uh, to feel that emotion um, in Amazing Grace and it's, it's easy for me to, to use the volume dynamics to try and shape and form and flow. So uh, another way to think about volume dynamics is, is of course crescendo and decrescendo. So for example,
it's so fun to play a flute that responds in this way. Um, it's just, it's very, very gratifying. The third component that comes together to create that feeling of it's so easy it plays itself is the, uh, the way that we go about tuning the flutes. We've used the constant breath pressure to tune our flutes for um, quite a few years now. Uh, gosh, it's got to be at least 12 years that I've been uh, at trying to tune the flutes to a constant breath pressure. And that constant breath pressure, that idea really came about when I was talking to uh, uh, Bill Holschel. Um, if you go to williamholschel.net, you can uh, listen to some of his music. Uh, he's a fat, fantastic musician. He was a saxophonist for Disney and, uh, and then got tired of that life and, and uh, wrote music for, for the gaming world in, in Vegas. And, uh, and now he's uh, making music and painting and uh, he's just a fantastic artist. Um, very, very talented. I asked Bill, I said, Bill, what is it that you are really looking for in your instruments in how they're tuned? And he says, Brent, I need a flute that is going to be in tune when I apply the same breath pressure across the entire instrument. So it, the, the, the intonation remains um, consistent within the flute. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. Because prior to that, I, I had a different philosophy on how I would tune flutes. So we began tuning flutes to a constant breath pressure. And it's a trick to learn to breathe at a constant breath pressure. We even, back in the day, we, I, I went so far as to uh, buy some equipment that allowed me to supply and I figured out a way to attach air, uh, compressed air, to the, the flute and, and supply it with um, exactly the same breath pressure across the entire instrument. And it didn't work. It sounded terrible. When, when I was done with the flute, I'd take it off and play it and it was like, oh, it was awful. They just, somehow that didn't translate. The, the, the compressor was not able to actually do what we do with, with our breath. And I shouldn't have been surprised because you can't take humanity out of the instrument and expect to have an instrument that's going to impact humanity. And so I abandoned that course and we just taught ourselves to blow to constant breath pressure. And it worked great until this year I finally got around to buying some equipment that allowed me to measure the breath pressure. Ty, you want to talk about this? Because in April, Ty implemented this equipment in our tuning booth and began using it. I did not expect the results that I got. What I expected was that perhaps uh, it would be a good training tool. It might teach us some things about the flute and it might teach us some things about ourselves and, and things that way. But, uh, but in reality, it made an enormous change in the quality of our instruments. Yeah, so what we do to tune our flutes um, to get that consistent breath pressure is first we go, I go through all the, all the notes um, with the breath pressure that I feel is appropriate. Um, and then afterwards, after I get it to you know, roughly where the tuning should be, um, I use our equipment. I stick a little thing in my mouth to measure the pressure coming out of my mouth. Um, and then I go through all the notes of the flute. Um, and now the breath pressure that we're aiming for is 10 millibars, right? Microbars. 10 yeah. microbars. And so each, go through each uh, note um, throughout the flute to make sure they're 10 microbars using our tuning machine and special equipment to get to, to, get to those notes. And yeah, I, I think it's really awesome, really amazing to use that special equipment. It's kind of funky when I was first using it, you know, having something in my mouth or two things in my mouth at the same time, but you know, the results, you know, are, are incredible. So, I've tried to make this video several times, and uh, yesterday when I was shooting it by myself, um, I was telling about this experience that I'm going to share with you now. I don't know if I'm going to have the same reaction right now or not, but I got to tell you, when I was explaining on the video yesterday, I literally got goosebumps all over my body because the, it, yeah, they're coming on. It had such powerful impact on me when I played the first one of these flutes that I had played after it had been tuned to the 10 microbars of pressure. And it was amazing. I picked it up and I played it and I didn't know. I didn't know what had changed, but I knew that that flute 
was freaking awesome. It was amazing, unbelievable. And I thought, what on earth have we done? What, how did this happen? What, how is this flute so amazing? I grabbed another flute that we just finished and played it. And, and just so that you understand, I, I, we make the flutes out here in the shop, off, or in the studio, obviously, but normally there's lots of noise. There's equipment running, there's always some motor running. Even now, we got fans running and you, I can hear them. And, and all of these things really take away from the ability to truly hear the instrument and to experience the instrument. So it's when we take the flute into the office and play them in there and test them for quality that we actually get to hear the flute in, in the impact that it has on us for the first time. And so I was doing that, I picked up the next flute and I played it and I was like, no freaking way, this one's amazing too. And I went through every flute and I was like, oh my gosh, I came running out here, Ty, they're amazing. Josh, these are incredible. I was so fired up. And, um, and lo and behold, from there on out, they all had that quality, all of the flutes. Now, we still get a lemon occasionally, you know, there'd be something that's not quite right and we need to fix something or something gets overlooked and we got to repair it or, or make it right. But it's so infrequent. Um, the, the norm for us now is amazing right from the beginning. So that was one of the things that happened that was so incredible. And, and just to really illustrate what I'm talking about, because it's tuned and we're measuring the breath pressure that we're tuning it at, it brought the tuning parameters even tighter than they were before and made it so that the, the flute, its intonation with itself was just off the charts. The other thing that happened when we start began tuning these flutes to 10 microbars, I was making a Brazilian rosewood flute for Kirk Metz and, and his was the first double flute that we made after this, this change had happened. And to kind of illustrate, let's see, oh, flutes, flutes, flutes. Okay, so to illustrate what we used to do um, to tune double flutes together, I would take and, uh, and put tape over the holes um, on the top and so that I could play the bottom holes. I put it in my mouth and I'll just do these top holes to, for example. And I went through every note. And, and tested the flutes to make sure the intonation together was perfect. These two flutes have not been tuned together. We did not, they weren't made together. They were made at different times. They weren't tuned together and yet they're amazing. The tuning is just incredible. And that's what happened with the double flutes. We went from, I, I, so I would do this tuning on the double flutes and then when I went to assemble the double flutes, we'd get them all assembled and I test it again as it's completed form, of course, and then I'd go in and retune it because I'd have to bring the tuning parameters even tighter. Um, but when we began tuning with the 10 microbars constant pressure by measuring that pressure, I put the double flutes together, play them, and did nothing. I had to do no tuning. They were perfect together. And you can actually see this video, uh, a video of this. It's uh, a Brazilian rosewood flute. Uh, it's up on YouTube and I'll put a link in this so that you can, uh, you can go watch that video if you care to and, and see my reaction to, to this, uh, this experience. It was really amazing for me. Um, so it's not, it's not that it took work out of our, off of me from having to retune the double flutes. That's not the benefit. The benefit was that the tuning is just so precise that uh, um, they just sound so much better. So when all three of these uh, items come together, the, the uh, uh, flute voice, the uh, constant or the, the constant breath pressure tuning, the volume dynamics, when you bring all three of those things together, you get an instrument that is not only sounds fantastic, not only uh, has incredible volume dynamics, um, not only has all of those individual things that each one of those bring into the flute, but they has a synergistic effect 
that makes the flute super responsive so anything you do comes out as sound in the instrument. Any energy I put into the flute in the form of breath pressure comes out and is, is just quick, spawns fast, and does everything I could want it to do. Um, so we'll go from talking about these, uh, the sound and volume dynamics, I wanna talk about the actual construction of the flute and the physical things that we do to the instrument to make them sound fantastic. And to do that, we're actually gonna cut a flute in half. So I guess we'll do this Coca Bolo. Yeah, I think that's a good one. This would be a good one with all this copper inlay on it. Yeah, let's do it. Cut it in half. All right, let's do it. Nah, I'm just kidding. We're gonna, we're, this is a failed flute. <laughs> and so we're gonna cut this one in half. Uh, not this one, this one's available. <laughs> and it's awesome. There's no way I cut it in half. So we're gonna cut this baby in half and, and, uh, and look inside. The wood sounds flu. Let's take a look inside this and see what kind of magic that holds. The first thing I want to uh, want to talk about and demonstrate to you is uh, is how we tenon the the flute end cap mouthpiece and even a a, a joint flute for us uh, a flute like this where we have one wood for a head joint, one wood for a tube, and, and we join them together. How can you do that and have that so it's strong, so it doesn't break when I hit my head with it? How, how, how can this be? Um, if you just take two pieces of wood and glue them together, then all you have to hold that wood together is the wall thickness of, of this wood. And we used to do that back in, uh, from 2002 to probably around 2007, six or seven, somewhere in there. That's how I did um, all of the uh, joints, was just a butt joint. And frankly, it worked pretty good. And they, they were strong and, and we didn't have very many end caps that broke off and had to be reattached and things. We did have some, but it wasn't a lot. And then uh, at some point, Leonard McGann and I became good friends, Lone Crow Flutes. He's, uh, he's since uh, passed, and, uh, but he was a, a wonderful man and uh, really a good craftsman. And he came to me one day and he said, Brent, how come you're using a butt joint to, to join your, uh, your end caps and mouthpieces? And I was like, what do you mean? And he says, well, you, you'd have a much better joint if you'd sleeve them together, if you put a tenon on one and put it in the other. And, uh, and sleeve those two together. And I, and I honestly hadn't even thought about it. I, I'm kind of embarrassed to say that. But, uh, but Leonard guided me through understanding this way that we could make our flutes a little bit better. And so, so now, in fact, where is that thing? Here we go. So here's a, a mouthpiece. And this is a Mapleboro mouthpiece, and this is a a Brazilian rosewood end cap. It's it's really not one that we can use the way it's right now because it, these are both have issues with them. But uh, but they're good for example. So so I have a piece of wood here that we've carved down. Can you that for me? We've carved down and, and created this piece that sticks up out of it. This piece that sticks up out of it is called a tenon when you put it inside another piece of wood. So if you look at this mouthpiece you can see that there's a tenon that extends from this walnut mouthpiece and that the walnut continues and goes all the way into the uh, slow air chamber. And this, this flute is obviously uh, a flute we had a lot of issues with. It's, this is not what they normally look like inside. And uh, that's why it was rejected. But uh, this flute 
this cherry and, and walnut now have all of this surface area, all of this surface area to, to create a really strong going. And not only that, but there's a mechanical um, function to it where you actually have the peg inside the other wood. So there's a mechanical bond that is above and beyond just simply the, um, the chemical bond of the glue. Then uh, on the end cap, we do the same thing. And this, uh, probably won't be able to see it from there. In fact, let me come up a little bit closer. And uh, how's this, Sam? Can they see me good? Is it close enough? I think so. Okay. So, so here's an end cap. To, and what we do is we put the end cap, uh, before we bore the flute, we, we take the end cap and, and the flute and we make a hole that's the diameter of the tenon in the flute. Uh, and then we put that into the flute body. So you can see that this walnut comes um, an inch or so into the, this cherry flute body. And you can see that the, that the um, turquoise and the ebony is all just on the surface and not, uh, does not go through. So this is, even now, if I take and hit that against something, it's, it's just not gonna break. It's very, very strong, even with it cut in half and, and compromised with its integrity by what we did with the bandsaw just now. So, um, that's a, uh, that's one of the, the things that we built into them. So, when we do this sort of a join, we do something very, very similar. And one of these woods, depending on which one we have more of, extends into the other. So, this, uh, this coconut palm may extend into the uh, black palm, or the black palm extends into the coconut palm. And, and that makes this just super, super strong. And I'm hitting it. And this is a flute that we're working on right now. I'm really excited about it. This one has a heron on it. It's got this Brazilian rose, or a Honduran rosewood burl that is uh, whew, gorgeous, gorgeous flute. All right. So we talked about tenons on the mouthpiece and the end cap. Uh, let's talk about the finish. When I first started doing our finish on flutes, I took a bit of uh, guff for it from people. Uh, I had people say to me things like, flutes aren't supposed to be shiny and, <laughs> and uh, things like that. And, and I don't think they really understood why I was using the finish I was and why I was making them shiny. The reason to make them shiny is, is just simply that a clear finish is naturally shiny. When you, when you shine it, you're actually making that surface of that finish more clear and that allows more light to go into the wood to reflect around and bounce back out at you in, in beautiful grain patterns, in gorgeous chatoyance or curl and any of those things that are there that are of interest get magnified because of the finish being so clear. And that is the number one reason that we, we make the food shiny. Now they look nice too, and that's a benefit, but, uh, but it really for me is all about the clarity and then allowing that light penetration and the light to reflect back. Um, it does come at a price though. The finish takes a long time to do. This material is a, a material that is um, non-toxic. It, uh, it's a material that's used in, in the medical world for actually inside the body, externally on the body, and also internally on the body. Uh, it, it's non-reactive with our body. It doesn't react with um, acids and bases, and uh, those things have no effect on it. It has no odor, uh, aroma. Uh, it doesn't uh, create allergies in people. Uh, all of those things that, that can be tough for us uh, when we, we have perhaps a flute that is causing an allergic reaction or something, those things can be difficult to deal with. Not only is it um, non-toxic itself, but it provides a toxicity barrier between the wood and the player. And toxicity barrier, what I'm talking about is certain, uh, many woods have within the uh, plant itself chemicals that the, the plant creates. This isn't something external that we have applied to the plants. It naturally occurs within the plant itself these, these chemicals that uh, 
that are there for the purpose of uh, dissuading biological infestations. For example, bacteria, ants, um, uh, fungus, you know, other insects. It prevents them from wanting to eat the tree. Maybe it makes them feel full fast, as in like caffeine. You imagine an, an ant going and eating on a, on a coca leaf and, and gets a bunch of caffeine in its body and it represses its uh, desire to eat. It also um, elevates its, its uh, metabolism and may even elevate it to the point that it kills the, the, uh, the insect. Um, but we don't want those things in our body. So the finish, if, if you're putting your, so if you're putting your lips on raw wood, you are going to absorb some of that, those chemicals that are inside the wood naturally, they will be transmitted into you. And that won't cause any problem likely in the first little bit, but over the years it can build up and get to a point where it creates a, a, a negative response in the body and you end up having perhaps a, um, an allergic reaction. Now, maybe your lips blister. I've talked to a, a number of of silver flute players that have wooden flutes that they play, or wooden head joints, and I've not seen any of the uh, classic, the concert flutes that have any finish on them at all. They, they're always bare wood with just oil for finish, and and they you can get to the point where that bare wood actually starts causing blisters on the lips, and which is obviously no good. And that's what we want to avoid with with our flutes. We want to be able to have people playing them for a lifetime and getting lots of joy and music and everything out of them. And so that's what I mean when I'm talking about a toxicity barrier. Not only is it a toxin barrier, but our finish also is an excellent moisture barrier. It's very, very water resistant. Now you leave water on, on uh, wood long enough, even if it has finish on it, and that water is gonna be just, it will get through at whatever it wants to over time and it'll seek out little cracks and ways to get into the wood because wood wants that water in it. Um, unfortunately, it can cause wood to swell and, and the swelling and contraction and movement can cause adverse reactions in the flute, it could cause it to crack or, or other things could happen. And so, so we want to avoid those things and we want that water to be kept out of the wood. So the finish does an excellent job of that. We, uh, we coat the, inner, the internal parts of the flute are coated with the finish, particularly the, the slow air chamber and the mouthpiece. All of this is coated with finish. Any of the wet areas are coated in finish. In fact, uh, uh, over the last couple of years, our, our rustics and our couch old style flutes that just have a wax finish on the outside still have, for the mouthpiece, has still got finish on it. All of the wet areas of the flute have finish. The nest area has finish, all the ramps, all of this area that's gonna get water, all have finish on them to protect the wood and most importantly, protect you from the wood. So additionally, we sometimes we'll use the flute, depending on the wood, we'll use the flute internally and we'll coat this, uh, the sound chamber with uh, our finish. Uh, if the wood is porous, uh, if the wood has uh, low density, sometimes we'll use it and it creates an excellent reflective barrier that, uh, that enhances the quality of the sound. Now on a flute like uh, this Coca Bolo in my hands, we don't put any finish on the inside of the flute. It doesn't need it. It doesn't improve the sound at all uh, because the wood is so dense by itself and the, the grain structure is very tight. It's not got a lot of porosity. So this, all of these wonderful things that we get out of the finish does come at a price. For example, a cedar classic tie, this, our simplest flute, I'll give you an example. This is one that is not done yet. It's just been um, formed. There's uh, some work that has to happen in the voice box area. There's gonna be some inlay work that's gonna happen and things on this flute. But uh, to get the flute from a solid block of wood until it's ready for finish, and, and the time that it takes to apply the finish. How, how do those things compare? So comparing, uh, to illustrate again, compare time of how long it takes to form the flute to get it ready for finish. Yeah. 
to how much time it takes to actually put the finish on, to sand the finish flat, you know, everything that we have to yeah. do for the finish. <clears throat> well, comparing the two, um, I would say with the Cedar Classic and, and, and other flutes as well, um, the woodworking process would probably take about 40% you know, of the creation time. Um, and then the other 60% would just be dedicated to the finish, you know, applying it, sanding it, and making it, you know, a wood sound food and making it nice. Yeah. That's right. Now we're not talking about the voicing and the tuning here. We're talking about specifically how much time it takes to actually form the flute and get it ready for the finish. And then how much time it takes to finish the flute and, and, and then get it ready for voicing and tuning and all that. And so, yeah, it takes more time to do the finish than it does any other part of the flute. Now, if you've got a flute that's got some outrageous inlays on it and things, of course those things can take a <laughs> take an awfully long time, <laughs> but but that's a different story. <laughs> so we're not talking about that. We're talking about just the part of forming it. It's worth it to us. I've thought about making flutes with simple finishes on them, like a nitrocellulose lacquer um, and, and other types of finishes like that. And every time I think about doing it. I think about the benefits that our finish brings to our clients, and I just can't do it. It's just too much value in how it protects our clients, how it protects the flute, and how it looks. It provides an awful lot, even though it does take a tremendous amount of time. Um, one of the other things that we've done recently is, uh, is we flattened, we, we machined the finish on this, on the voice box. You want to talk about that a little bit, Ty? Yeah, so uh, to get this completely flat um, so that there's no air leaks or you know nothing can cause problems with the sound, we use uh, a mill and we mill the, the voice box area, this nest area, completely flat um, just to make it, you know, so there's no chance that any air can escape. Um, so it gives us the best sound because if air is escaping, you know, it just creates all sorts of problems with, with how the flute sounds and can even create problems in the tuning. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it really can. It can create a lot of different challenges if you have air leaks um, under the totem. Uh, one of the challenges is really simple. It, the energy you're putting into the flute isn't getting made into sound. And so you, it's taking you more energy to play the instrument than it should. And, and that if it's a really severe case, it can even feel so much like it's kind of sucking the life out of you a little bit. I've had flutes that felt like that before, and uh, until I figured out what the problem was and was able to resolve them. And, uh, so this machine, the finish, we obviously, we, we, uh, we get this surface very, very flat with uh, the knee mill. Uh, a mill is a tool that allows you to, um, to get things done very, very precisely. It's a, it's, the tool used in metalwork and things and, and holds to very, very tight uh, parameters, thousandths of an inch. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's just been huge. You can actually see the machine marks now on the finish in the nest area. If we were to sand those machine marks off, it wouldn't be flat anymore and, or might not be flat anymore. And that risk is just not worth it. It's just not worth it. Uh, the risk, and so I've uh, I made the decision that we're going to leave the machine marks on there. We, you know, we sand a little teeny bit, but uh, with you know like 800 grit kind of thing. But the rest of that, no, nope, we leave it. Okay, let's see. Super flat. We seal the slow air chamber. Gosh, I think we've talked about a lot of the physical things. There's some things we haven't talked about. Uh, one of them, these these two items go way back in my flute making back to uh, the first six months of me learning to make flutes. Um, when I was making them, uh, back then I'd go to tie them on and I didn't have the, the dexterity yet and I didn't have the techniques yet of tying the totem on. And man, they drop off on me all the time, they're falling on the ground, da, 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 and it was driving me crazy. So I put these side rails on the flute, a channel in the flute. Now our classics don't have these side rails because it doesn't acoustically affect the flute, other than it provides an additional wind barrier. But uh, 
but it does make it a lot easier to put the totem on and tie it on when you have a totem that's, uh, that, needs, that doesn't have holes in it or something. One like this is so easy to just slip over that that's quite different. The other thing is on the totems themselves. And if you look at this totem, right around the embouchure hole, I have two little arms that come out. So that, that little channel in the, in the totem, I call this channel the chimney. And that chimney, uh, the reason that I have it here is when, when you have a stream of air or water uh, moving past a stationary um, fluid, like uh, more air that's stationary, or um, in the water example, if you're out spraying something on your lawn or, uh, to, to help your lawn be more green or whatever, they'll often use a, a sprayer that is a, a container of the liquid that you're gonna spray on, and it attaches to the hose, and it's got a little pipe that comes up, and that pipe gets in the stream like this, and the water going past pulls up the, the liquid below and sprays it out onto the lawn. The same thing can happen on the flute, that as you're blowing air out of the, 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 um, out of the flute right here over the embouchure hole, air that's stationary on the outside gets pulled into that stream of air. And so to prevent that from happening, because any additional air that isn't there by intent it can cause uh, windiness and cause other sorts of sound uh, that, that's not desired. Uh, I put the side rails there and that wind doesn't have the opportunity to be pulled into the, uh, the airstream that we're blowing across the flute. An additional benefit that it causes that I didn't understand in the beginning is that when I'm playing outside and I'm in the windy conditions, I turn my flute to uh, crosswind like this and, the, and these little um, chimney protects the airstream from the external wind. And you're able to play in much more windy conditions with a totem like this and, and a flute like this than you can if it doesn't have those things. So the next topic I wanna talk about with you is, is the last one that we'll talk about today and all these technical things are, are good. They're, it's good to technically try to get things as precise, I think, as we can. And yet, it doesn't have in it the whole spirit of the flute that, we're, that we want people to experience and have the opportunity to experience. And, the additional part that we put in is, is what intention do we have as we're making our flutes? Every flute that we make is made for a very specific purpose. Or every flute that we make, every flute that we make is made for a specific person. We may be making the flute originally for inventory and then it's going to be sold at a festival or on the web or something like that, but ultimately that flute is going to a person and our, our purpose, our intent, is that when that person gets that flute and plays it, that their experience is transformative, that it's positive, wonderful experience for them. And we put that intention into the work that we do. I know that's a bit ethereal and it's maybe a bit out there, but I really believe this is something that is fundamentally um, important in, in flute making for us. It's, it's a, a fundamental core belief. Um, Ty and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, and you had a really fascinating um, comment to this that I did not expect, Ty. Would you share that with us? Yeah. So, <clears throat> I'm Navajo, and one of the things I've learned um, you know, growing up is, is whenever we create something, um, our, our thoughts and our intentions, they leave us, they leave us through our mind and, and they go into whatever we're creating. And so of course, if we're thinking negative thoughts as we're creating, um, those things will leave us and go, 
go into what we're making. And if someone, you know, partakes of the thing we create, um, if they play the flute that we make or or partake of the food that we make, you know, they'll they'll receive those emotions. So it's important for us um, to have positive thoughts while we're creating um, thoughts of of thankfulness, of, of happiness, and, and forgiveness even. Um, it's really almost a prayer, isn't it? It really is, yeah. yeah. So we leave that prayer with whatever we make. And that goes exactly the same thing with our foods. You know, we, we need to have these positive thoughts because they're, they're for someone and we want someone to have this flute and you know, enjoy it and, and have a great time with it. Yeah, we really want, we really strive for you to have wonderful experiences with our products. Um, we probably fail sometimes and we're sorry that, uh, that we do occasionally make errors and, uh, and make mistakes. But our intention and purpose is to make the world, is to help the world be a little bit more beautiful than it was before we did the work we did. Um, we hope that you have a wonderful day. If you have any questions, or thoughts, comments, by all means, please reach out. My uh, address, my email address is brent at woodsounds.com or you can reach me at 801-822-1415. Again, this is Ty Allison. I'm Brent Haynes. And we hope that you have a fantastic day. Thank you. Bye.